identifying your research topic? How did you get there? You know, what inspired you to want to even look at this plant? I took an entomology course and dissected a cockroach with a rugby player and she was freaking out and I was just chilling. So at that point I was like, geez, I really might just like insects and I might just like plant. So maybe let's just put the two together. Hello, Patrick Thomas, and welcome to PhD Hard Talk. Thank you so much for your time today. How are we? I'm great. Thank you very much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Excellent. So could you please do the honors to um, basically introduce your research and then we can take it from there? Yeah, sure. So um, I am currently a graduate student at UC Riverside in the Botany and Plant Sciences Department working under the uh, guidance of Dr. Linda Walling. And my research focuses on identifying uh, resistance genes in alfalfa that are important for um, controlling uh, white fly nymph development on alfalfa plants um, during infestation. Okay, excellent. So the reason why I wanted to talk to you, because I love plants, but I have a tendency of drowning my plants. Um, they never make it like past a week or something, or, you know, maybe three days sometimes kind of thing. So that's why I'm really excited to have yeah. a conversation with you. Hopefully I'll learn something, <laughs> even <laughs> though it may be a different plant, but I tend to drown them. So let's go, let's crack on, right? <laughs> so in terms of your research then, how does it benefit the wider community, like myself, for example? So I think it benefits the wider community in the, this is a really good question. Um, so I think it benefits the wider community in the sense that our lab is a functional genetics lab. We're, we're trying to figure out, okay, like what are these genes and what do these genes do, especially in the context of controlling insects? So I think on that basic level, it's very critical because as climate change, it persists on and environments change. I think one of the things that gets kind of ignored is that um, these environments will change and then the things that can live in these environments are also going to change. They're going to be things that are going to be living in places that should not live there. Mm -hmm. And they are going to maybe like some plant hosts that we don't want them to like. Um, so as more invasive species are interacting with more plants, we're going to need to have a better understanding of how those species interact with the plant hosts. And there might be host plant resistances that already exist in some wild relatives of domesticated plant species. And maybe we're not taking the genes that we find in alfalfa and conferring them or transforming them into other plant species. But on a basic level, identifying invasive species and trying to understand how genes change in host plants in response to them is really, really important work. Beyond that, I would also say alfalfa, there's not a ton of work done on alfalfa. It's a very difficult plant to work with genetically. And anything we could find out about it in terms of biotic interactors and how there are resistance mechanisms or genes that are able to confer biotic or abiotic stress tolerance in alfalfa or other non-model plant organisms is, is huge because we, we have to feed a lot of people and we have to get creative in how we feed a lot of people. And, of course. And, and there are tools probably at our disposal that we just don't know about and doing more exploratory work like this and trying to figure out how genes are changing in response to biotic stressors is just it's going to help a lot of people whether it be breeders or whether it be people who are trying to improve the taste of our food um because all these people are going to kind of interact with the data so we have to start somewhere so yeah Okay, excellent. Um, so in terms of, you've just mentioned there that there may be species that will move to that area, da, 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 it may not work. But isn't that exciting for a scientist to know that <laughs> there's a possibility that might happen and that will lead to further research and more findings in a positive way? Um, so I think you're, well, I'm not saying you, but me, I think there's always this kind of like, instinctual thing as a scientist where um i'd say race gender sexuality inclusively there's kind of like that we're, we're wired in a way that we're like oh yeah like you know like but what if this happens what if this happens yeah. and 
part part of me, like a very small part of me is like stoked. I'm like, oh man, they're always going to be invasive species. I'm always going to have work. But then part of me is like, a lot of me is just not so stoked about it because of the like actual consequences and like, it's going to impact people's ability to make food. Um, there was a couple years back in the Punjab region of India, there were several farmers who their cotton crops were just absolutely devastated by white flies and several of them unfortunately took their lives because like that was their livelihood so part of it is exciting but also just knowing the consequences and like knowing the difficulties that especially breeders and farmers in the developing world are facing um trying to just make food literally to just pay for the roof over their head it's also a little scary um so yeah, actually thinking about your question again, I'm kind of like, all right, I am worried about it, but also I think with the tools that I'm getting, I'm excited to kind of address the issue, but there's still always that thought in the back of my head that I'm like, ah, oh, geez, like people are really suffering and it's like, we have to act like, yeah. Well, when it comes to suffering, I feel as a scientist, we can't really um, eradicate that part. And as you mentioned, the example in India, it's not just the cotton farmers, there's, there's other farmers, um, you know, for example, with the spices and stuff, they've taken their lives because they feel like the government's not giving them the, the fertilizers, etc. So there's a, there's a lot, there's a, um, a big host of things that, you know, link into that. So it wasn't actually, yeah you know, or organically, just the, the cotton, there were other political factors. So you can't take those in as well. Your job is to find a solution scientifically. So if there's an opportunity, I feel like you should go for it. Yeah, I would, that is a true point. I will say, I think for someone doing functional genetics and like non-model organisms or just doing like functional genetics or like looking at like plant pathogen interactions this is like the best time to do it um like the the tools at my disposal and like at other researchers disposals are, are just wild like the things that i can do um i was just like at dinner with my pi um last night and like the things that i can do in a day it would have Hold taken on. why wasn't i invited to dinner <laughs> <laughs> I, the time zone would have made it. Why was it not invited? I I know it's all good. But, um, it's it's always kind of so. I think like going again, going back to your question. Um, yeah. it's it's also exciting. It's you you kind of I'm reframing it in my head again. I'm just like oh, it's still more exciting because I think about my PI and the things that she had to do to like kind of get like one day's worth of research done. And like now it's the kind of thing where I can sit here and code for like half a day and do what she would have done in a day and then go back to the lab and get some other stuff done. So the technology at my disposal kind of makes it exciting to kind of like tackle some of these issues. Yeah, and you know, with all the challenges that we're facing globally when it comes to food shortages, um, especially in the third world or the global south, um, as you may call it, I feel like your research could benefit those in rural areas, you know, in that sense. Hence why I'm shaking the table <laughs> in, that, <laughs> in that sense. But in terms of your methodology then, why choose the methodology that you've gone for? Good question. So I, I guess this is, um, this is I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about the project. Um, so the project is technically a 30 year old project. Um, the project has been extant for about as long as I've been alive. Mm -hmm. So it started in the early 90s. And the, the reason that I'll, I'll get into it in like a couple of seconds. So started with a breeder in Northern California who had a large um, population of alfalfa that he identified white fly resistance in. And he screened about, so what he did was he wanted to um, make a germ plasm collection of alfalfa. And to do that, he screened thousands of lines, tens of thousands of lines um, to identify these highly resistant alfalfa plants. And then he used them to create um, some resistant alfalfa cultivars. And in doing that, what happens is alfalfa breeders will take plants with desirable traits and they'll randomly cross them. So yeah. then what you get is an alfalfa cultivar is kind of like this large population of just like individuals that are genetically unique. 
So overall, the population might have the trait that you want, but there's no guarantee that each individual in the population will have that desirable trait. And alfalfa breeders do that because they want to maintain a lot of genetic diversity in their population. So it's great that like um, there aren't pressures that kind of will wear away at those traits. The, the converse of that is that when it comes to people like me who are trying to find these genes, there's just like so much genetic material to work with. And because all these individuals are different, um, you kind of have to, you have to sift through your populations to find plants that you want to work with. So basically for the first like three years of my dissertation, um, I had to do, I had these large populations that um, the late Larry Tuber, who was a breeder that started this um, alfalfa white fly resistance breeding program initiated at all these populations. And we knew that um, some populations were more resistant than others, but we had no clue what individual in any population was. So before we can even do any genetics, um, I had to do a very um, technical screen where on individual alfalfa plants, we would put a certain number of leaves on a plant and then we would kind of just score the plant to see, okay, a lot of young white flies are on this, it's resistant, a lot of older ones are on it, they're developing, it's susceptible. So we did that and you end up finding these highly resistant lines. And then from there, you can go on and do um, like really fun genetics. So the reason we kind of did what we did was based on what alpha, how alfalfa breeders function. They like to maintain a lot of genetic diversity in their populations. And again, it's great for not losing traits um, over time, but like when you're trying to drill down and do something very technical and identify like a locus, it's a pain in the butt because like you have to do all of this extra screening just to identify plants that you want to work with. And only then once you identify those plants, can you do the fun science. So very long-winded way to do what people in a rabbitopsis can do in a fraction of the time. Okay, so my understanding, I'm thinking of Tiger King, <laughs> but <laughs> from the way you've explained it, so he breeds, you know, tigers based on the documentary that is, is it like a similar process in that sense, because he would take one species and mix it with another species to create something that people would like to purchase, but then when it grew bigger, he would get rid of it, look at your face. <laughs> No, no, no. Um, I'm, 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 I did that because it was funny. It's a similar analogy. It kind of works out. So basically what... Um, did alpha I, did I just leave you there? <laughs> <laughs> the scientific knowledge just departed the ring. No, 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 no. You're good. Um, so <laughs> the way alfalfa breeders breed is if they have like, let's say six into like, let's say there's a field of like 10,000 plants and they find 20 that they really like. They'll take those 20 and they'll put them in like a glass box and they'll introduce a bunch of bees into the box. And what the bees do is they just pollinate all of those plants randomly. Okay, and then pollinate, right? I'm with you. Yeah. Together now. So then the idea is that 60% of the, there's a 60%, about a 60% chance that the trait that you really want is going to be in your offspring. Okay. But it's about 60%, which is what makes it annoying because in a rabbitopsis, if you know you have a dominant parent uh, like a homozygous dominant parent and a homozygous dominant parent and you cross them you know what your f1 is going to be and the real disadvantage in alfalfa is that you just don't know what your f1s are going to be after you do those crosses okay. so for us to even get to the point where we're doing fun work you're it is kind of like tiger king you're just doing a whole bunch of crosses and the first part of my dissertation was literally just looking at someone's crosses and trying to figure out like okay well how good were these the answer is they were very good, but it, it took a lot of work to figure out that they were very good. Go on, Tiger King. Yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, um, back to your work then. In terms of identifying your research topic, how did you get there? You know, what inspired you to want to even look at these plants? That's a really good question. So, um, my parents came from a developing nation. They both migrated from Dominica and I was born and raised in the States. So 
um neither of them graduated from high school so like it was always an emphasis on science uh growing up they wanted me to be a doctor um it would be the kind of thing where like i was watching jeopardy and we'll jeopardy like every night and then like i'd have to memorize my times tables like at seven or like six like so they were drilling math and science in me from a real young age um i think by like high school i knew i didn't want to go to med school um and i did um plant science research at my high school and I was like, oh, man, I'm kind of good at this. And like, I was going to science fairs and winning some science fairs nationally. And I'm like, I might be able to make a living out of this. So um, one thing led to another. I met somebody at Penn State um, who gave, offered me a scholarship. And I think I decided, like, oh, I don't want to work in plants. I want to do food science for a bit. And then I didn't realize that, like, there was a lot of chemistry in food science. So I was like, no, nah, this is not for me um and then I was trying to like find myself and I was like oh plants are kind of cool and then um I realized like yeah I also kind of like insects because I took an entomology course and dissected a cockroach and I dissected a cockroach with a rugby player and she was freaking out and I was just chilling so at that point I was like geez I really might just like insects and I might just like plants so maybe let's just put the two together Mm -hmm. um So then I got to grad school and my PI was like, oh, well, I have this project working on like alfalfa and white flies and identifying resistance. And I was like, this seems like really long winded and difficult and like interdisciplinary. Sign me up. Oh, wow. Uh, Very interesting. I mean, me and bugs, rodents, we don't really mix like that, but you know, (laughs) good on you. (laughs) Good on you um, in that sense. So in terms of the next steps then for your research, you you did mention off off air to say um, you are going to do your postdoc. Is it in the same field? Are you continuing forth or are you stepping aside into something different? in terms of research focus? Um, There's actually like a good bit of overlap. So um, the next lab I'm gonna be working in is working in um, disease resistant traits in cocoa, uh, cacao trees. So it's not quite the same thing, but there's a like, there's some overlap there disciplinarily. Um, And then also there are- You can write the words people, we just can't say them. (laughs) It's a difficulty. Literally, we can spell, but we just can't verbalize the words. (laughs) It's a thing. So I'm going to integrate um maybe like my postdoc research and my PhD research Mm -hmm. but then um what's really cool about my PhD research is I did some RNA-seq so I'm sitting on some of these RNA-seq data sets that like nobody has ever made and I'm kind of like analyzing the data and I'm like ah geez like I can probably crank a paper or two out of this I'm like there's some collaboration opportunities there so there's some overlap there. Um, I think some of my PhD work also have to kind of like work on independently to wrap up. But um, the hope is to like kind of take this alfalfa white fly stuff and integrate it with other non-model host plants and um, other plant pathogens and just kind of learn more about like the different types of like feeding behaviors of different insects on different host plants. There's so many different things that we could do with this data set. I'm always looking to collaborate with folks. So this is like a shameless plug right now in the interview that like um, DM me on Twitter or email me if like you want to talk about comparative transcriptomics. Um, like, yeah, I'm always down. So I'm now thinking, um, cause I love to think why don't you go to a place like Brazil? Because there's a lot of insects, there's a lot of plants, trees that some of them haven't yet, you know, made it, you know, in terms of the, the world out there, they're still thinking of a name. So why wouldn't you go and do your research there? That's a very good question. Um, And I would like to um just bang the table for a minute for the state <laughs> of California and say that it has a very robust agricultural agriculture um infrastructure and the diversity of insects and plants that you will find in the state is vast. Um, I remember in a qualifying exam I had a PI asked, okay, so like you've lived in Pennsylvania and Michigan and you've lived in California. Um, Of the integrated pest management programs that are in each of those states, which one probably is the most convoluted and nuanced and I had to think about it for a minute and then eventually the answer was California because there was just so much flora and fauna here um Mm -hmm. that you it's it's always great to leave and explore other things but 
I didn't really need to leave. There's an incredible opportunity. Um, I can go drive into like large agricultural operations in like a half day. So there's no real need to even hop on a plane to go see one, though I would always be, I'm always down to go see one, but I mean, we have everything. Immigration in Brazil, call us. <laughs> <laughs> We need a holiday. Um, <laughs> but no, that's really interesting. So in terms of advice then for somebody um, who's in between, who comes from a similar background as you, parents have said maths, English, sciences, we want you to be a doctor, medical doctor, um, you know, keep going. And they're thinking, well, I want to do something that I'm passionate about. How can they introduce that message to their parents without offending since you've gone past it what advice would you give them um yeah uh so i think part of it, it it's really tough because i think the individual can do quite a bit and i think part of it is education i think like i come back to everything um especially like with the situations we're seeing in the states sociopolitically everything I come back to is like education, education, education. Like if you educate people, you give them the opportunity to like unlearn the bad stuff that they know or like the ignorance that they have. So I think for my parents, it was just like exposing them to careers that they did not know that I could have and like not be worried that like, oh, you know, like I'm going to be struggling financially, even though that's not the only thing that matters, but like they needed to see that those things existed. So I think part of it is just like, um, as young people, you need to expose yourself to different careers and you need to expose people around you to different careers and let them know like you know like not everybody needs to be a doctor and not everybody you know is going to be a medical researcher and that's totally fine um i would also say that i think societally we need to do more um especially because like i just don't think we see enough black people in these roles i don't see enough black entomologists i don't see enough black plant biologists or geneticists or plant pathologists. So I think representation, it always also comes back to like education and representation. So I think the more representation that we see, the better. So I think part of it is that person can expose their parents and things and then let them know that like, um, you're young. And I think, at, you know, depends on where you are, like, especially if you're under 18, I don't think that you should, you should not have to know what you want to do. Um, if you know you want to be in STEM, that's great. You should like take some general courses. You should always be trying to like fill your mind. Um, but I like, I didn't know what I wanted to do until I was like 21. And uh, like, well, I knew I want to go to grad school, but like, even now I'm going to be 30 in a couple months. So like, I think I want to do nonprofit work, but like, even then I'm like, I think I might want to make money for a little bit. So like, I'm not sure you ever really know what you want to do until you know, but I think just exposing yourself and the people around you, and I think just societally, we need to provide more support, especially for BIPOCs, um, to just say like, hey, no, you can do this just because somebody's not doing it. It's just like, you need the support to get there. Okay, just to add on to what you've said in terms of people um, at home, um, you know, it's all about research and knowing what's out there. There isn't a course for Caucasians or Asians or Black people. We're all humans at the end of the day and the opportunities are there. You just need to inquire and, you know, take it from there. And sometimes you'll get rejected. Um, you know, you have to be resilient as well and willing to put in the work. Just to add on to his point um, so that everybody understands, you know, you haven't mentioned your struggles. Um, you know, in terms of what you went through to get to where you are. So we need to bear that in mind before we write anything that's a bit out there, just in case. So back to your research. <laughs> so in terms of, I'm just thinking, you've mentioned that you're moving to, to do your postdoc. It's not necessarily in this topic, right? This topic that you've done before, for your well you're still doing it now for your phd was it a topic that your supervisor introduced to you yeah it was um because i wasn't too versed on white flies before i started grad school and she was just like oh well we have this project in the lab and just kind of walked me through it and um that's kind of how i got into it i was like all right well yeah i guess i'm doing this <laughs> Okay, so just in terms of people who are out there who would want to do a project that they haven't necessarily thought of, 
what motivated you and what excited you? Because usually when you think of your own topic, you have to excite yourself because you have to believe in it. So this is somebody else's. What excited you from year one, year two, up to year three now? You know, what excites you about it? Um, I think what excites me about it is um, knowing the impact that the research has and <laughs> knowing the skill set that I'm going to pick up. I think those are the two biggest things. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't want to hang up too much on the host plant species or like any of that. I think um, coming into grad school, it was more about picking up a skill set. Um, I really, because like, I remember somebody telling me like, you're getting paid to be smart. So like, you should find a project that interests Did you. Did you repeat that again? Yeah, Thank you get paid to be smart. <laughs> Thank you. Did you guys hear that? <laughs> important <laughs> so yeah I think as long as you're finding a project that like I think part of it is you have to go in with an open mind if you're finding something that has a skill set that correlates with what you want and like is hitting some interest points um I think it's okay to compromise and be like all right well this isn't something that I would have worked on and maybe this will be interesting because I didn't think I'd ever work on white fly um host plant resistance and now I can code in three languages because of it. So like, it's worked out. Like I've learned a lot of stuff and um, yeah. you always have to just like, I think if you know you don't like it, you don't like it. But um, I think part of it is just being receptive mm -hmm. to things and just being like, look, I'm trying to like learn some skills. So um, for those folks who are in the States who are like thinking about rotations watching this, like don't try to like go into all your rotations knowing exactly what you want to do try to like have a general idea but like try to pick up some skill sets because like you never know what skills you're going to need or what you're going to want to do in the future and it's always good to just kind of like sometimes be a jack of all trades and a master of none because you can always just dip into that bag of tricks and you know and step up literally so essentially what you're saying is if the door's open go in leave your pride behind and learn you never know in the future yeah yeah you never know um my pi did not work in insects at all for her undergrad phd or postdoc and now it is exclusively a plant insect interaction lab um and that that kind of thing happens there is a decent chance that i'm probably going to be working on some organism or some plant that i don't even know what it is right now and i'm like all right well i'm resigned to that and i'm like it's cool and this is just kind of how it goes Excellent. So in terms of advice, then, when we're looking at things from a global perspective, you've mentioned that if you're in the US, what advice would you give somebody in a third world country right now who's thinking, right, I've been offered a scholarship, for example, Germany, that's just an example, and I'll be looking at um, bacteria. <laughs> I'm not really into bacteria, but I've been offered the opportunity. What advice would you give them just based on you know, your circumstances based on family and your current situation? Yeah, um, so it's not quite the same thing, but my family's 3,000 miles away. So that's like, that's something I had to think about before I got out here. Um, I think if you're being offered something like that, I would say, I would, I would think about like what you want to do for a career and think about is that place going to support you internally and externally like are, is working in that lab going to give you the skill set that you need to do what you want to do or if you don't know what you want to do is working in that lab going to give you the skill set to say like hey I know what I want to do yeah. and I'd say the other thing is just like externally like that's a far way to travel and that might be like a, a huge culture shock let's say if you're going from like say um India to Germany um it's a huge culture shock so like I think the other thing is just like knowing externally like if you're gonna get the support like are you know you're gonna feel homesick but like are the people around you gonna support you and make you like you know be able to like buckle down and get your work done um because if you're not happy and you're not like just chilling I feel like your lab work is just not it's not good and like nobody's happy um so I think just as much as like if you get that scholarship offer, you need to think about, are they going to put you on a trajectory where you're going to pick up that skill set 
and that career, like those career um, interests that you have, you also just need to be in an environment that supports you and working with people interpersonally that like you just like, because nobody wants to go to work. And like this research is hard enough as is, um, RNA seek is hard enough as is, it does not need to be more difficult dealing with jerks in the lab. No, um, thank you very much for, for your wise words. I have one more question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go for it. Um, that is, why did you agree to come on PhD Hard Talk? Um, I agreed to come on <laughs> because, jeez, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I came on because I think it's important that um, people see Black people in science and that I put myself out there mm -hmm. and that people are like, oh my gosh, like, yeah, this is a person that that did this so like I'm not not to like knock other scientists and like oh like people like nerds or anything like that but like you know I'm like a black kid who was born born in Queens raised on Long Island I like college football I, I play pickup basketball a lot um I think part of it was a representation and then also just seeing your um your channel um I think things like this are important that um PhDs need to connect, uh, whether it be interdisciplinary to collaborate or not, like we need to know that we all exist and that mm -hmm. there are people out there that are supporting knowledge and the curation of knowledge and um, yeah, the curation of knowledge is just like objectively important and like being smart is like cool and fun and like y'all are promoting that. So I was like, I have to like come on and support. Excellent. Wow. That was well thought out, even though it was on the spot. <laughs> So love it. So in terms of the next steps then, don't forget to share, like, subscribe, and it's project dissemination to the world. Let's share all of our knowledge with love and humility. Thank you very much for your time, Dr. Patrick Thomas. Thank you. Pleasure to be here.